So for our next presentation, uh, Digital Autonomy Standards, uh, it'll be given by Mr. Mark Rothkeb. Mr. Rothkeb is a senior researcher, uh, research engineer in the Systems and Emerging Capabilities Division at the Pennsylvania State University's Applied Research Laboratory. He is responsible for the design and implementation of multiple systems autonomy architectures used in both weapon systems and unmanned maritime vehicles. Recently, he has led a research team in development of cognitive autonomy systems for the Office of Naval Research, focused on next generation intelligent autonomy for long duration and highly adaptive unmanned underwater vehicles, UUV systems. While his experience with autonomous systems has primarily been focused on the undersea domain, it has also included surface, air, and ground vehicles. He has contributed to multiple autonomy standards development efforts, including a lead role in the development of the ASTM F41 Subcommittee Standard Guide for Unmanned Undersea Vehicle Autonomy and Control Architecture. And he's a maritime SME contributor to the Joint Architecture for Unmanned Systems Standards maintained by SAE. He's currently chair of the Unmanned Maritime Autonomy Architecture, UMA, that is being developed as part of PMS 406's standardization efforts. Mr. Roskeb, please. Okay, um, just check to see if you can see my screen and hear my voice, please. We can and we hear you loud and clear. Thanks. Very good. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, <clears throat> As, as was mentioned in the end of that uh, intro, uh, my recent work has really been to extend the idea of standards uh, into the maritime vehicle community, specifically with regard to uh, unmanned surface craft and unmanned undersea uh, craft. Um, and this work uh, has been sponsored by uh, PMS 406. This is gonna be a little bit of a apples and oranges uh, to compare to some of the other briefings and that I'm, I'm probably gonna be a little bit more nitty gritty and that this is standards work that's in progress. And, um, you know, there's been some funding behind it to actually develop standards in this particular area uh, by PMS 406. And a lot of that stems from the fact that, um, let me see if I can hit my next slide button here. Okay, it's not switching. Oh, there we go. Um, a lot of that is motivated by the fact that uh, as time has evolved, uh, PEO USC uh, on man's uh, uh, surface craft uh, has pulled in much of the work uh, in terms of programs related to, uh, mar bo again, both uh, surface and, and underwater uh, unmanned maritime vehicles, which were spread out uh, across some of the other offices. And there is still some of that uh, work being done in other places, but they became kind of a focal point for um, the, the unmanned systems and, and the maritime realm. So as you can see, you know, there's uh, different programs listed up there that they are responsible for uh, all the way from a very large USV, uh, you know, on the upper right uh, to some very small vehicles, um, uh, not shown pictured, but uh, LDEV kind of on the left there in the blue box, which is uh, like a 54 inch uh, diameter vehicle for under undersea underwater uh, work. So uh, as a result of these programs proliferating um, and, and more unmanned systems coming into the maritime realm, which has already happened in the air, air realm for quite a while because there's been a lot of commercial sector application, uh, unmanned air vehicles have been kind of leading the way. Maritime has lagged just because of the lack of commercial uh, momentum uh, as compared to the air vehicles, but that's starting to change as particular in the uh, DOD realm. And so, uh, you know, in the past, the development of these uh, monolithic systems that, you know, were one and done, I'm building my uh, interface uh, C2 control system, and I'm building my vehicle, I'm building the payloads uh, for a particular mission space. Uh, we're doing so many of those now, the idea was to look at what standards can we have that can actually start to uh, create value for the Navy and not having to reinvent or repay contractors to do the same type of work over and over again. So as a simple example, when you think about driving a vehicle, the commands to drive a vehicle, you know, 
even if you think about driving your car, you have a steering wheel and a gas pedal and in and, and maritime vehicles, you have very common things that can be interfaces can be standardized for. So that's what EMA is really trying to do. Standardize the interfaces so that you can bring in different components uh, into play in both vehicles so I can exchange uh, my system software system on one vehicle to another because it's got the same driving interface or I can talk to different vehicles via the same control system on land right now we bring in separate control systems for every type of vehicle that we have and we'd like to get away from that uh, operators having to learn that so Yuma is dealing with the uh, vehicle on onboard autonomy in particular um, and the c2 side is actually a separate working group that we collaborate with um, so uh, again just to name a few of these programs the large and medium esv are, are very large programs being uh, funded by pms 406 there in the in the billion dollar range the Orca um, is a large, extra large UV currently contracted to Boeing. And so that's like a, a 85 foot vehicle. So you see some of these vehicles, even the undersea vehicles are very large. So the goal of PMS 406 was to accelerate autonomy development uh, by, by creating more of a DevOps environment. And so in, in really a lot of what we're talking about is software interfaces, uh, not so much the physical systems, but how do we allow ourselves to reuse software across um, the, the Navy programs? And in industry, it's very common to have a uh, DevSec, uh, DevOps uh, environment for agile development. So if you go to a Google or you go to a, you know, Facebook, they, they build, test, and deploy software onto the internet seamlessly and so if there's a bug that somebody has it goes from you know somebody fixing that problem to testing uh, by you know serving that out to you know hundreds of users proving the tests and then deploying it through a mesh network out to the whole system well it's a little different from the DOD unmanned systems because we don't have hooks into those uh, deployed systems we you know we normally have them in a shop we test them integrate them send them out to the field so doesn't quite line up, but the idea is to use agile software processes to do this. And so DevOps is integral to what we do. And in fact, the development of our standards, the ICDs, interface control documents that we put out, and the automated, uh, the code uh, generation standards that can be built into your code base, uh, which is called IDL, um, is fully automated. So nobody right hand writes any uh, ICDs, we, we have an engine where we define a specification and that gets generated into an ICD along with some boilerplate text and things like that. So we have a fully automated uh, pipeline of, of generating and updating uh, ICDs and IDLs that are uh, standards within the community. Um, So I, I kind of pointed out at the beginning, but I just wanted to clarify, our work is specifically on the vehicle side. So we're really trying to develop standards such that we can share inside the vehicles that are developed, share code bases. Um, the separate effort called the Common Control System is a little bit different, and that was we're, whereas Yuma is trying to define the interfaces and let vendors bring to bear both their, their vehicle systems and payloads they can also bring software that meets the interface standards uh, into the system. And so we're not actually building, as part of our effort, we're not building these software elements, components. We're actually allow industry to bring those in as best of breed. Common control system is a little different in that on the uh, C2 side, they're actually building uh, the software itself under a service-based architecture, much like we are. But part of that uh, development is being done by both government and industry. So we are we are simply in Yuma specifying the interface standards uh, to which people can build, so that now we can build uh, componentized systems and bring in different components versus building a monolithic system. An interesting point of that is the technology right there currently exists is able to do that quite well. The contracting around that is still 
in flux to be able to manage contracts in that manner. It's been done before in the submarine community with what's called the submarine advanced processor build where different contractors bring in components, but it hasn't been done in this realm yet. So this is kind of new for unmanned vehicle systems. So I'm really not gonna talk about this too much, but the main point I wanna make here is when we did the assessment of what kind of interfaces and services should be provided for unmanned vehicles, we had to do a functional breakout of what an unmanned vehicle consisted of. And the, the box, blue box here does not represent an architecture. It, rep it represents a functional architecture, not a physical architecture. So we were not trying to specify how you build your autonomy Rather, we were doing this as an exercise to define what types of services were needed to do things like mission management, manage your payloads, sensors and effectors, do comms, um, maneuver the vehicle, and, and have perception awareness, uh, situational awareness about your whereabouts, you know, why navigation solution and things like that. So this breakout uh, published in an architecture uh, design description document allowed us then to go define uh, microservices and the interfaces uh, that would cor correspond to those uh, services. I might point out, you would say, what is the um, genesis of the Yuma standards? Like, did you just come out of you know nowhere? Actually, it's building on many, many years of work, started with ASTM uh, committee F42, uh, the standards that was mentioned earlier in, in the intro, um, there's been uh, joint architecture around manned systems actually began in the 90s uh, that formed many of the interface definitions that have been incorporated into an SAE standard um, called the um, unmanned uh, control segment architecture, UCS, which is an SAE standard. So all those things that I mentioned, the ISTM and the JAWS rolled into a, a industry standard, SAE, and we're basing our, you know, it's model-based system engineering model uh, for a platform independent model. And we base our, the derivation of Yuma on that standard. And we are adding to that and we'll eventually roll back Yuma uh, definitions and interfaces back into the SAE standard. That hasn't happened yet. Uh, we've actually published our ICDs, uh, but we have not rolled them back into the SAE standard. And that is a, a long-term goal we have. Um, the one thing that's different that we want to keep different is because we're using an agile software process, we can actually publish developmental ICDs on a daily, you know, weekly basis uh, as we make changes via, um, you know, kind of software, modern software methodology, uh, cut a, cut a, cut a uh, release baseline every couple months that can be applied to contracts. But a standards process such as SAE, you know, takes many, many months and even a year to do an update. Uh, so we will probably continue in that realm where we eventually roll stuff back into the SAE standard over time. This kind of is a picture of the goal where you would like to create these interface standards represented uh, in the long yellow boxes in, in this figure where we have a common way of talking to the vehicle from our actually mission software that gets developed. Uh, we have a standard way of talking to a command and control system, and we have a standard way of talking to payloads. Um, they have different challenges for each of those three areas. Uh, vehicles is probably the easiest because they all need to be driven in a similar manner, although they might have different types of propulsion systems. Uh, there's still power associated with them and how much power you're using and you can monitor where there's gas, gasoline or, you know, a battery being drained. There's, there's a lot of parallels across the driving of vehicles. Payloads uh, can be very diverse. Uh, however, there are classes of payloads that can be have standard interfaces. So that's where that sits. And I mentioned about the C2 uh, coming to a common system external to Umascope and us working with them in parallel to develop an interface standard. They started with the JAWS standard as their published interface, but that is gonna to have to evolve over time. And finally, the one thing that wasn't mentioned is there are standard services within the autonomy itself that aren't talking to these external things like payloads of the vehicle or C2 that 
you know, we don't want to keep redeveloping. So think about an unmanned vehicle knowing, um, you know, the charting system, uh, charts and uh, geographic information. That's all common. The world is the world and it doesn't change. So, you know, why do we develop different charting systems for different missions so we can have standard services uh, that apply? And the goal is to make that mission autonomy in the very center as small as you can. It's actually going to solve your problem, and we're going to bring in components to support the standard types of things you do across these EMA interfaces. An important um, aspect to remember when you think about this is to make this effective, the government has to own those interface standards. So that's what's been established through the SAE process and the EMA standards. The government publishes that and maintains that through a, a board uh, that I lead with a single representative from the major unmanned vehicle communities um, across both surface and underwater. It's a small group of about 12 people so that we can actually move effectively forward. Uh, it isn't too big, uh, but it's also got a, a pretty broad representation. There's only one person from each organization. And then within the organizations, we have SME support to back, back us up. So what are our products? What do we produce as, in terms of standards? Well, as I mentioned, the architecture design description, uh, we have a governance document that talks about how we operate. Uh, I will point out that that's a thin document because we're, again, we're using um, modern software development methodology. So that most all of the governance, the actual physical governance and the way we operate the uh, standards board and the subboards below it to actually implement things and do reference implementations to prove out the interfaces. That's all online, and so it can be a little more dynamic. And the governance document is really an overarching document talking about how we operate as, as a whole. Finally, the compliance specification in terms of governing documents is a very important one. Uh, having been involved in standards for many years, um, one of the things when you talk about software standards that happens is people say, well, that standard doesn't meet my need. I, I can't, there's no interface to do this particular thing. So if I take this interface and extend it by adding this thing, it'll work for me. And so what happens is standard breakdowns occur. And so what we really want to do is have people input, put those changes into our governance process, which we have set up and are, are operating currently and say, we need this revision to the standard. And so because we're agile and can turn those around very fast, they can get a developmental release in a, in a matter of a week and say, here's, here's where the final release is going to be three months from now. Um, here's our developmental release so you have a document to go by. And again, the way the contracts management manage that is, is up to them. But the compliance specification is a very tightly uh, defined doc requirements document that says, if you want to claim, proclaim Yuma compliance, these are the things you have to do. You have to meet all the interface standards you can't leave any out, you can't extend it, you can't add to it, but you can put inputs into the governance to see things changed. Um, underlying this is a, a model-based system engineering model, the UCS model that I mentioned. I won't really go into that. Uh, but finally, the outputs are two things. We have interface control documents that define explicitly the interfaces that need to be met to meet compliance. And then we auto-generate um, IDL code for software developers to use. One of the challenges we have right now is we would really like to, these to be across industry like SAE and JAWS are right now and ASTM for that matter. Uh, however, we work under you know DOD contracts where things by default are distribution D. So we are currently in the process of releasing these documents as distribution A. Once that occurs, and it looks like it's well on its way to being approved, uh, these industry standards will be out, uh, are available to industry. So, um, you know, say a vendor of a vehicle could actually develop um, their their system to have that that standard built in, giving thus giving them a competitive advantage because they can say, we already support a human interface driving interface. You don't have to build one for us. Uh, something if you're familiar with something like ROS, um, that is a de facto standard in, in robotics that is kind of a, a picture of the goal we would like to see.
I just wanted to note here that one of the things that we're doing as part of Yuma is requiring all these services and interfaces to be published on a common bus so that if people do want to bring in new services and, and recommend the standard and they need inputs, um, those things are all published, all service information is published on a bus so they can get access to that and that's using the data distribution uh, standard developed by the object management group. So that's another standard we use within Yuma and layer protocols on top of that. It's what's called a publish subscribe architecture where everything is available kind of to everybody and, and DDS takes care of the inner computer networking. It's all transparent. All you need to do is publish your information and if you want some information you subscribe to that topic. So it becomes a very flexible architecture for adding new services over time and defining new messages um, that anybody can get the inputs they need to develop the services they need. Finally, I mentioned compliance, uh, and so I, I kind of covered that already, actually. Uh, but we have very strict definitions in here that have to be met to claim you in compliance. And uh, that's it. I, I left a, a little bit of time for questions, it looks like. So uh, if anybody would have any questions, I can handle them at this point. Thank you. Yes, we have a few minutes for questions. Chris? Okay. Yes. Um, the question, first question I have is, does UMAA oversee UAVs or just underwater vehicles and systems? Yes, that's a, that's a great question. Um, one of the challenges of our initiation was sought through in the charter is the larger scope you take, the larger cooperation you have to get through different communities. So, you know, you could say, well, could we actually, um, you know, make this apply to robots and, you know, air vehicles and space vehicles. And so there was a, a, a definitive choice made at the time to apply to maritime um, surface and undersea craft. However, I will say that the, the people on the board are well aware and they have actually been involved in JAWS standards and things like that, So, uh, which look broader and, or, and MDE, the, the, um, the UCS model is very broad across all domains. We're doing explicitly maritime domain ex extensions, but with an understanding that we would not exclude things that apply to the other domains. And I'll give you one example of this. So, so the answer is no, we're not including them. But the other answer is when we specify something like altitude, we use an argument that allows it to be in the air, above ground level, above sea level, above the sea floor, and at a depth. So you can see that even though our interface standard, um, we're not scoped and, and required to do that, we're actually providing uh, maritime domain extensions that are aware and trying to incorporate that as much as possible. We would not be, however, be doing things like uh, talking about our particular airfoils work and things like that. So when you get down to some of the specific physical components, we would handle the maritime vehicles. So maritime vehicles have compartments, they have flooding, you have to you know, worry about um, health uh, of a ballast system. Uh, those don't exist in airplanes and there's things in air vehicles that don't exist. So, so we're not dealing with those, but we are dealing with the gen general things that apply to both. 